Good morning, everyone. My name is Jenny Yen Yu Chu. It is my pleasure to be your moderator for this session. Before we begin, let me pose a question. Have you ever thought about the impact of your purchases on the planet and its people? Whether it's a new gadget, a piece of clothing, or your weekly grocery. Each purchase holds the potential to make a positive difference. And today, we're going to zoom out to examine the sustainable procurement practices on a larger scale, its application to Asian development banks operations and beyond. It is a topic close to my heart as a procurement specialist at ADB. We have an exciting lineup of speakers joining us on stage, including Bruce Gosper, ADB's Vice President for Administration and Corporate Management, who will deliver our opening remarks. Following that, Jeff Taylor, ADB's Chief Procurement Officer and Deputy Director General of Procurement Portfolio and Financial Management Department, will provide an overview of sustainable procurement work at ADB. We also have Dr. Kaha Dimitrivili, Deputy Chairman, State Procurement Agency of Georgia, as well as Noel O'Brien, Director of Climate Change at ADB's Climate Change Sustainable Development Department. Joining our panel discussion and sharing the insight and experience. So during that panel discussion part, there's going to be um, the Pigeonal app that you can use to submit your question. You can see the app's um, QR code and link on the screen. So let's give a warm welcome to esteemed speakers and get started. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jenny, and welcome, everybody. It's good to see you um, this morning, and thank you for very, very much for joining um, this important discussion about uh, procurement, which has been organised by the ADB's uh, Procurement Portfolio and Financial Management Department. It, of course, uh, addresses the theme of this conference, A Bridge to the Future, and an important issue that's uh, on the minds of everybody, uh, not least uh, the Asian Development Bank, and that is, of course, the range of challenges that face our region uh, and our developing member economies, uh, in particular, of course, climate and the challenge that we see arising from that. Um, we're all conscious, of course, of the scale of this, not just in this region, of course, where we, we have 60% of the world's population, 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions and fast-growing economies, which have needs for employment and growth uh, for its, its burgeoning populations. And that's one of the reasons, of course, why the bank has been so focused on this issue. We see the tremendous impact of climate change. The, since 1991, between 1991 and 2020, more than $1.5 trillion in costs arising from floods and droughts and billions of lives affected during this period. So the bank has it's set itself the objective of being the region's climate bank. Just last year in 2023, 10.7 billion US dollars in climate finance, an important contribution, of course, towards our commitment of $100 billion by 2030. So the scale of the challenge we face is quite large and it requires contributions and partnerships uh, across the region with, with many, many players. And procurement has its place in this as well, of course. Uh, we do a lot of work in procurement. We aid policy dialogue. We provide financial commitments. But procurement can have a, a much more fundamental transformative impact if it contributes in different ways to the sustainability of our economies. We spend more than $9 billion a year in procurement. Um, and the decisions we make on that have fundamental impacts. Of course, they have to produce value for money. They have to produce the right product at the right cost. But the way, ways we do that can also have implications well beyond that in specifying, of course, that we take into account things like climate impact, carbon footprint, the way we look at the impact on marginalised communities in the references we have to social inclusion and the like. These are all important ways that we can contribute to this issue as well. So it involves conscious decisions about procurement so that we can drive these sorts of positive changes. But of course, it has wider implications and there are reasons for doing this that we really should reflect on a little bit more. It's not just about moral duty and giving attention to these changes. 
It's because we know that economies that prioritise sustainability reduce their operational risks, they gain from best-in-class technology and every day we see new technologies emerge, uh, and of course they gain increased market competitiveness. So sustainable procurement um, can play a pivotal role, not just in addressing some of the big challenges we face, but of course in ensuring that we empower communities um, to benefit more profoundly from the money that's being spent on these sorts of things. So like you, I look forward to the discussion and the contributions from our panellists, um, and I'd like you to welcome them here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, um, and welcome, everybody, uh, and good morning. When I first realised the enormity of the challenge that is facing the planet, um, I will admit to being depressed and, and, so, and pretty scared uh, as a parent, as, as a member of uh, um, this planet. And I, I started trying to change my lifestyle, recycling the trash, taking my own cup to Starbucks, glaring at people that didn't. Uh, and then began to realise that this wasn't out of my control. There was a lot I could do in my privileged position at ADB to influence things for the good. Um, and, and, you know, as, as Bruce has already pointed out, ADB started on this journey uh, some time ago. Uh, and I'm really enthused by uh, the ability to contribute in some way towards it. Now, but that's, that's enough about me and perhaps too much. Um, how does ADB work towards this? Um, the first is the most obvious. We're a financial institution. We provide money. Uh, and that can be through loans, grants, guarantees, and other financing mechanisms towards climate mitigation and towards climate change. Sorry, Jeremy. Um, and we will use this money towards implementing sustainability and sustainable procurement strategies in part. And that will be underpinning everything that we do in the procurement space. Uh, all of our projects will look at sustainability in their design. We will seek opportunities and so forth. The second way in which we um, try to contribute in a positive way is through technical expertise. ADB is uniquely positioned with a view both within the region of all the public procurement systems that it operates in with its DMCs, but also through its ownership with the systems of Korea and Japan, the, the developed member countries, and also through the network of the multilateral development banks. And, and there is a very rich and deep conversation going on right now with all of the MDBs over sustainable procurement issues, which, which I'm actually very happy that ADB is leading on. Um, and then through technical assistance funding and the development of our own resources and staff, Jen has been leading internal training on sustainable procurement within ADB and more importantly for our developing member countries. Um, so building our own capacity to engage and contribute to sustainable procurement. Then through procurement policy and reforms that integrate and institutionalize sustainability issues, um, and Jenny will talk about a couple of the countries where we're actually working with them, to introduce green and sustainable procurement into procurement policies and institutions. Um, one of the most exciting things, and Bruce touched upon this, is market shaping. Our ability to signal to markets that this is this is a bridge to the future, whether it's demanding green cement, whether it's demanding green steel, whether it's looking at the physical length of supply chains and, and the carbon produced through them. Um, this sends a strong signal um, from our clients to the market about what the future looks like in terms of supply chains. Um, and the market will invest in meeting those needs to maintain a competitive advantage. Also through proofs of concept, and again Jenny will touch on a couple of these um, later, um, where you will see worked examples of sustainable procurement in action, whether that's environmental, whether that's social, whether that's governance, whether that's institutional. Uh, and again, some more details. I, I won't steal Jenny's thunder on this uh, later. Um, next slide, please. Um, Old-fashioned procurement was very process-driven. 
um, limited to the transactional flow of inviting bids, evaluating bids, and awarding a contract, uh, often resulting in the lowest cost or, or the lowest price, but not necessarily the lowest cost. Very simplistic, risk adverse, um, let's approve the lowest number and nobody can accuse us of taking any initiative, being brave or being wrong. Um, unlike old-fashioned procurement, sustainable procurement requires taking a holistic view, not just looking at the transactional process, but looking at the design of a project. Uh, and it can be as fundamental as, do I build a road or do I build a railway? Do I build an MRT? You can regard that as a procurement decision, although my sector colleagues would disagree, but it is that fundamental, that which is to be built. It will then go on to how will it be built? What will it be built of? How am I going to select who will be building it um, based on the metrics that I choose? Um, the benefits of sustainable procurement are actually very, very clear, um, um, and that includes an economic competitive advantage for societies that do it, but it goes to environmental sustainability. It goes towards economic uh, and social development, circular economic benefits. It goes to improving governance, and it goes to improving supply chain and country resilience. Um, next slide, please. Effective sustainable procurement plays a key role in both mitigation and adaptation. For example, mitigation, renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable transportation, low carbon projects, eco labeling, uh, and so forth, all of which contribute to reducing the amount of carbon that would otherwise be produced. In terms of adaptation, disaster risk management, um, making facilities, infrastructure, uh, and societies more resilient to the shocks that are coming with greater and greater frequency. And also nature-based um, solutions. Why cement? Why steel? Um, can wood be used? Can different products be used? And a fascinating example in Singapore, if anyone's got some time, of the, the highest um, building ever made only of recycled wood uh, and so forth that didn't use steel, that didn't use cement, but used uh, a nature-based solution. So next slide, please, Jenny. So what has ADB done so far in this space? Um, quite a lot and not enough would be uh, my answer. Um, we launched late in uh, 2022 uh, a guidance note on sustainable public procurement, which is really describing, to quote Juan Bismarck, um, the art of the possible within the procurement space. We have since updated all of our standard bidding documents to factor in sustainability and environmental issues, and we're continuing to work on those. Uh, and later this year, we will be launching, relaunching our standard bidding documents to incorporate qualitative merit point systems um, as the default standard that will encourage our borrowers and clients to actually incorporate sustainable procurement elements into all procurement transactions. Um, we have focused, as I mentioned briefly earlier, on building our own internal capacity with about 120 staff so far trained within ADB on sustainable procurement. Uh, and we have delivered training so far in nine of our DMCs to um, government officials there, and that will continue. Um, we supported a gender responsive procurement report, and we plan to do more. Um, we are adopting, um, in, uh, we are piloting increased gender focus in our procurement documentation in five pilot countries right now. That applies to the entire procurement portfolio. We have adopted a build for skills handbook which will incorporate social inclusion within the procurement process in terms for disadvantaged procure, uh, communities, in terms of uh, underemployed communities, and in terms of developing the skills within those communities for a more sustainable development outcome. Um, we are piloting green procurement, environmental procurement, and social procurement considerations across a number of projects where we, th opportunistically, where we see that our clients are aligned with us uh, and have initiatives that we can support. 
I think it's very important for me to highlight at the moment, uh, at this point in time, that sustainable procurement doesn't belong to ADB. It is not an ADB policy that we impose upon others. It is a methodology and a way of thinking where we support and buy in to the sustainable procurement priorities of our developing member countries. Uh, and we've undertaken a diagnostic across all 41 of our DMCs um, to really find out where each one of those are um, and to start working with them to support them in that. Uh, and on that note, I'll hand over a quick video uh, and to Jenny. Thank you. Let's move on to have a closer look at some of the examples of the work that's mentioned by Jeff on project level and on country support level. Here, ADB worked with the government of India to pilot green cement specification under this water system development project. The sustainable procurement intervention came through from as a result of early engagement in strategic procurement planning, which led to market maturity research on green cement, looking at things like technical standard, local supply availability, and cost. And that ultimately led to specifying um, of this green cement requirement in the project. By using the green cement with higher fire content comparing to ordinary Portland cement, this project has achieved additional significant greenhouse gas emission reduction. And it now sets the way forward for other projects to consider this kind of intervention as well. Sustainable procurement, as Jeff mentioned, is more than just green. So in this Ulaanbaatar urban infrastructure project, ADB partnered with Mongolian government to integrate on-site local traineeship in construction project. That's part of the Build for Skill project um, program mentioned before as well. And by embedding this community participation and capacity building in the bidding process, the initiative provided job training for local youth, enhancing their skills for future infrastructure roles and fostering climate resilience, leaving a lasting legacy extending benefit beyond the asset that's being built. Another focus of ADB's effort, as Jeff mentioned before, is on assisting the developing member countries in developing their own sustainable procurement policy, which Dr. Kaha will highlight in our discussion later on. Aligning with the national SDG goals and target, as well as the country climate action plans. And that is through initial country diagnostic that you have watched before, that we're able to pinpoint these priority areas for policy dialogue and customize support strategies, leveraging existing initiative and coordinating with other partners. Some of the examples include our work with the government from Fiji, Indonesia, and the Philippines, in involving development of country knowledge, workflow integration, how to guideline, training program, and tool to enhance regulatory framework, fostering an enabling environment for sustainable procurement to make an impact. So we also very much look forward to our furthering our partnership with the Georgian government on this front as well. It is evident that there is no fixed linear pathway to effective sustainable procurement program. So before our panel discussion, let's watch another video showcasing the Philippine government's collaboration with ADB on the journey. A pleasant day to everyone joining the 57th annual meeting of the ADB Board of Governors. I'm Rowena Candice Ruiz, the Executive Director of the Philippines Government Procurement Policy Board Technical Support Office, and I'm grateful for the ADB for this opportunity to share with you the Philippines' journey towards sustainable public procurement. In the Philippines, a tin can may not be a cookie tin can after all. Most likely, this would have been repurposed into a sewing kit. While this practice may not be driven by any procurement or governmental prescription for that matter, this reflects how easily practice becomes a tradition, which thereafter becomes a way of life, deeply embedded in our consciousness that it becomes a muscle memory for us without the need for enforcement nor incentive. 
This, to my mind, is how public procurement policies become an effective vehicle for the achievement of our SDG goal on responsible consumption and production. Public procurement has the inherent reach and influence to shape the trajectory of resource production and utilization. Governments have the positioning advantage of generating demand for more resource-efficient and environmentally sound goods, services, and infrastructure projects, thereby creating a market primed for circular economy and away from the traditional linear pattern of consumption and production. Thus, the Philippines, through the GPPB, inspired by the logic that government should lead by example, approved the Philippine Green Public Procurement Roadmap in 2017. This is a voluntary instrument that aims to transform the Philippine market by integrating green practices into existing procurement process. Beginning with common use supplies and equipment, or what we call CSEs, the roadmap identified mandatory green criteria for 10 CSEs which shall be centrally procured by the government. On the other hand, there are 10 non-common use supplies and equipment, or 10 non-CSEs, with green criteria but are only for voluntary adoption. SPP in the Philippines is not limited to environmental. We've also managed to break some fundamental barriers when the GPPB approved in 2023 gender-responsive procurement strategies that are meant to support an enabling environment to stimulate equal opportunities for women-owned and women-led businesses for a more inclusive and competitive public procurement system. But beyond roadmaps, the effective implementation of SPP lies on the ability in this case the government, to sustain a robust implementation framework in the medium and long term. Thus, in the year 2020, the Philippines through the GPPBTSO reassessed the 2017 GPP roadmap and saw the imperative of establishing a monitoring system for the collection, assessment, and systematic use of GPP data to effectively manage and enhance SPP performance, to align sustainability standards alongside clear policies and strategies tailored to the specific economic, environmental, and social challenges in the Philippines. Also in 2021, we sought the up to upscale the implementation of the GPP roadmap by looking into the pain points that bars procuring entities from fully leveraging procurement as a means to transform the linear pattern of consumption and production in the country. As we aim to step up our game by upscaling our GPP implementation, we are further motivated by the positive results of the 2022 UNIP assessment for SDG Indicator 12.7, wherein the Philippines through the GPPBTSO was commended for good performance on SPP implementation, specifically on legal framework, practical support, and environmental criteria. This provided more reason for us to reframe our GPP implementation by shifting to broad product categories covering non-common use items and this time with mandatory green specifications. In 2023, the GPPB approved the pilot implementation of the mandatory use of green specifications for the seven broad product categories. This aims to institutionalize the mandatory adoption of green specifications for non-CSEs and provide flexibilities as procuring entities can now readily add items within the broad product categories without need of prior GPPB approval. To ensure sustainability of all these efforts, we have also included SPP provisions in the proposed amendment to our 20-year-old procurement law in order to achieve value for money on a whole life basis, not only to meet specific organizational needs, but for the benefit of the society and the economy, while reducing adverse environmental impact, as well as pushing for inclusive procurement, one that will engender an enabling environment for meaningful competition across all bidders. While we have the policies in place, we need to ensure that this is actually implemented. Often, the devil is in the delivery, as they say. We have also included professionalization provisions in our proposed legislation. Moreover, we are developing, with the kind assistance of the Asian Development Bank, a GPP hub with facility for assisting procuring entities in the design of, procure or of project proposals with resource efficiency and resource sharing in mind, veering away from unnecessary purchases, and as well as a GPP 
Impact Toolkit that utilizes AI in assisting procuring entities in making an informed green decision in determining the appropriate environmental criteria or design for each of their procurement project. Indeed, public procurement policies that push the needle further towards government purchases with minimal environmental impact throughout their life cycle, as well as those that enhance energy efficiency and better resource utilization is key to our sustainable development. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Maraming salamat po and mabuhay tayong lahat. Thank you, Rowena. Now I'd like to move on to our panel discussion, diving into the why, what, and how of mainstreaming sustainable procurement for climate impact. So Dr. Kaha, I would like to put the first question to you, if I may. And thank you for having us here in Tbilisi. Every country's journey on sustainable procurement is unique. So amongst some challenging times that we're experiencing, Georgia fought ahead and adopted sustainable procurement in your 2020 procurement law. Can you share with us the motivation that your team and country has toward this move? Well, welcome. Uh, the, welcome to Sakartuelo, name of this country, Sakartuelo, not Georgia. Welcome to Sakartuelo. And <clears throat> I do hope that during your let's say next annual uh, meetings, you will have uh, some video clips about the Georgia as well with our some uh, already advanced outputs or outcomes and uh, Jeff will deliver uh, the, the, the presentation also on our outputs or outcomes will, or success stories, I, I would say. The Jeff mentioned uh, way of thinking when he calling the definition of uh, sustainable public procurement as a way of thinking and he starts from his personal life and family life and something, and I, I, I like it very much. Uh, well, I'm coming from academia, and I, when uh, we started this journey six years ago, we called it philosophy or concept. And it's the same, actually, the philosophy concept. It's a new philosophy. Uh, most of you, I believe, are uh, public procurement or procurement professionals or at least financial professionals. And so uh, we are changing the philosophy. We are changing the approach. We are changing the concepts in, in, in uh, public policies, I would say even, and not only in procurement practices. So six years ago, maybe a lot of uh, uh, this, let's say, discussion participants, you are expecting from me that I will refer to the, our international commitments, right? You know that we are um, uh, association member, we, we, we are candidate member state to the EU, and sure, we have a lot of commitments against the European Union. We have association agreement, now we have a special roadmap, let's say, more broad. We are member, sure, of United Nations, we have UN SDGs, we have, uh, you know, this new strategy of European Union Green Deal. Uh, there are a lot of new OECD rules and recommendations. But the, still six years ago, the main motivation was, let's say, integration of this new concept and philosophy into the, our internal reforms. At that time, it was great time and that we uh, find out the synergy of uh, international assistance, I would say, and I, I appreciate very much it was huge uh, support from EU for environment regional program. It was a huge program covering five countries, I guess, including Georgia and from UNEP, United Nations Environment Program. Uh, UNEP is a leading UN agency helping countries in uh, transforming of SPP or uh, GBP. And uh, so we receive a huge support from on one hand. On other hand, we, and this was a unique story from Georgia, I would say, success story. We say no to any, let's say, what was the proposal to have first the country strategy, then concept note, then action plan, and then so on and so on. A lot of strategies, a lot of papers, Jeff. 
no papers, we say no papers, and we decided to introduce directly or transform this support, this knowledge support, this innovation support into the directly into the primary legislation rules and regulations. And we have already up to 12 different articles in the primary law, in the primary public procurement law, in order to support this policy. Then, according, well, uh, the, each reform of this country depends on the, I believe, uh, on the cultural, men, mental, traditional traditions, on, on legal stories, or real politics, and so on and so on. Well, my country, we love very much bylaws. So the, in this country, a huge, uh, let's say, the, the real uh, changes, the real um, rules and regulations are enacting by the second pieces of the secondary legislation. And then with support of UNEP and some other, and Asia, from Philippines also, we had uh, experts from UNEP, uh, the lady, uh, we, we drafted uh, by law, decree of the government, and we mm, decided to start step by step. This was also unique, our story. So when, uh, when uh, introducing the sustainable public procurement concept philosophy or way of thinking, uh, so we decided to firstly decide the sum uh, or cover uh, the list of the goods and not services and not construction works because of difficulties and comprehensive manner. Uh, we, we choose the biggest and most competitive and uh, most competent contracting authorities or procuring entities in the country who can manage really these, those policies and really enacting and not small kindergartens or small schools. And we, and we set up this, uh, the monetary threshold that it's above, we introduce the mandatory approach. This is also a unique Georgian story that uh, our contracting authorities, those listed contracting authorities for procuring of goods it's absolutely mandatory to apply SPP criteria and not voluntary. And this is a unique story. Now we are, uh, the next steps are actually to, uh, to extend, to expand this list of the goods and then uh, move to the services, uh, to expand, uh, the, the, the enlarge the list of the contracting authorities and to decrease the monetary threshold. So this is the unique Georgian strategy, so thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kaha, and congratulations to you and your team for rising to the challenge. Noel, now I would like to turn to you. As a thought leader on climate change issues in ADB, what's your view on the potential of sustainable procurement for climate impact? No, thank you, Jenny, and good morning to the participants at this, this uh, panel. And I just like to begin by saying, being part of the, the panel has been an interesting process because I think it opened up some discussion between our climate change team and our pr procurement team at ADB and, and realizing that there is already some synergy in, 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 in place. Um, it's not an area I'm comfortable being the climate person with speaking procurement, so, so bear with me. But, but from our perspective, the potential is huge. And more importantly, by dealing with procurement in this way, it allows us to deal with change at a systemic level. Um, there, with the wide array of goods and services uh, covered by procurement and its sheer scale, it gives uh, the potential to the kind of things that Jeff has already talked about uh, in terms of shaping the markets, encouraging responsible practices, which thereby allow us to drive the impacts for climate across the systems. Um, and if we look at the DMCs, they're increasingly establishing goals and targets in their NDCs and their national adaptation plans. And we know that next year that all countries will be developing new and more ambitious uh, DMCs. Sorry, new and more ambitious NDCs. So when procurement decisions are aligned with such targets, uh, they have the potential to drive change and, a pro and to uh, promote innovation through the supply chain. So, so a really important opportunity. And how can sustainable procurement support ADB's own climate mitigation and climate adaptation initiative and goals from your perspective? 
So maybe I'll turn, the, I, I think what we have already in, is a, a very much a scaled up view of the role uh, that finance ministers uh, can play particularly in their role in relation to public procurement and, and what Dr. Kaka has talked about in detail. Uh, but we see this engagement with the finance ministries as critical to, to scaling up climate outcomes. Um, ADB has already started an initiative where we are aligning our work with the, uh, the global uh, coalition of finance ministers for climate action. Um, and we've uh, working with a number of regional networks um, because we see this as an important approach to achieving that change. Uh, we recently launched the, the Climate Resilience Fiscal F Facility for Asia and the Pacific. And this is aimed at strengthening the capacity of ministries of finance to scale up and align finance with the low emission and climate resilient development. Um, and we recently uh, took a specific uh, policy uh, engagement with the Association of Finance Ministers for ASEAN. And, and we're looking forward to scaling that up with other uh, regions, uh, with the Central uh, West Asia, but also the Pacific and South Asia. And, and just for, for, because your procurement specialists may not be aware of this, but the Coalition of Finance Ministers has been active since uh, 2018 and from 2019 onwards under the, co uh, the Helsinki principles. And so they've already um, published a guide book on mainstreaming climate into economic, fiscal, and financial policies, um, and, and addressing uh, public procurement as part of that. So I, I, I think this is a really important area for us to take forward. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. Jeff, I want to turn to you next. You've talked about ADB's commitment to mainstream sustainable procurement. As ADB's Chief Procurement Officer and the Chair of the MDB Head of Procurement Working Group on Sustainable Procurement, can you share with us your view on why ADB and other multilateral development banks should play a lead? Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, a very good question. Um, MDBs actually have a voice that is disproportionate to their financing envelope. Um, we play a leadership role and set examples um, or, uh, and provide guidance to many of our mem member countries. Um, uh, and it's beholden on, on us, uh, as a member of the MDB community, um, to take a leadership role in this, not a reactive role, be, to be proactive. It's part of the MDB evolution. Um, I mentioned the old way of procurement, the risk-free uh, way of procurement. We are all, as a group of MDBs, working very hard to move away from that old model. It, it's challenging, but the journey is well underway and irreversible. Um, it started off around concepts of value for money, uh, and now we realize that sustainability is value. Uh, and we have to incorporate that into our approaches. Uh, and we do have a unique insight um, because of our membership across the whole planet, uh, essentially. Um, there are, I think, 17 institutions in the MDB HOP network now. Obviously, the, the larger ones like ADB, World Bank, um, European Investment Bank, but also uh, regional ones like New Development Bank and so forth. Uh, and if we look at um, some of the data and research coming out, for example, from the en Energy Trans Transitions Commission, the ETC, um, around 30% of heavy industry, 30% uh, of global emissions come from heavy industries in three parts. Um, number one, cement and concrete. Number two, steel. Number three, asphalt. Uh, that's 30% of global emissions. Um, if we can take deep dives into heavy industries and work with partners such as UNIDO, uh, such as the Indian government who have green cement standards, we can really amplify what we're doing. Uh, if you see things like this uh, appearing green cement specifications on a project in India, 
and um, see it used successfully, why not all projects in India? Whether World Bank Finance, whether ADB Finance, or the vast proportion of projects in India financed by the Indian government. Uh, and people can learn from those examples, um, other countries as well. And it doesn't necessarily have to cost any more. And in the longer run, it will cost less in totality. Um, and, and through that, we can help create a virtuous circle uh, in terms of, you know, I, I look at the Philippines, a country I know quite well and have worked. I live there, of course, but I've worked with the Philippine government on and off for about 25 years. Uh, and they benchmark themselves constantly on what's going on across the region and across the planet uh, and really push themselves to do more and do better. Uh, and, and part of what we're doing here is the advocacy. It's not the technical process. It's the advocacy for something that is a public good and something that we should all be paying attention to. Thanks, Jeff. And it's um, really good to hear that the uh, MDB communities align on the importance of this agenda and working together on that. So with that, let's turn our attention now to putting it in action. I would like to turn it back to Dr. Kaha. Thank you for sharing with us the um, drivers of the country and some of the action that's been undertaken um, in implementing sustainable procurement or um, starting this journey in, um, in your country. Um, can you share with us maybe some of the opportunity and challenges that you've faced along the way um, so far and, and your view um, on how to tackle that going forward? Well, in, you have to know that I have been limited for two minutes by Jenny in advance. And so, <laughs> I guess it's more interesting for you uh, to touch on, on challenges and then opportunities. Opportunities are in place, you know, it's, everybody knows. Uh, well, um, when, uh, when I was mentioning the synergy of the, let's say, Georgian government strategy, it was at that time we were developing the few strategies, very much important strategies like uh, public finance management new strategy, e-governance strategies, on, uh, the new strategy on circular economy, and uh, the new strategy on the small and medium business development. So it was very much interesting to touch and to see those cross-cutting, I would say, issues in those areas uh, regarding the opportunities. Regarding the challenges, a lot of challenges, you know. And this is, I guess, the, my most interesting uh, input for this conference or for this panel, the, the lessons learned, or negative or positive lessons learned. Well, challenges, I would say the mentality mental challenges. Well, in, in this country, because of maybe of our, let's say, previous Soviet past or something, well, we are spending around the 13% 13, 13 of the GDP and around the 65% of the all public expenditures are covered by the public procurement. It's a huge money. And uh, uh, according to the, let's say, Georgian legal tradition, and high corruption tradition, governance tradition, public administration, we have very much strict rules and regulations. What does it mean? It means that each public, we have approximately in this country 4,700 contracting authorities from 10 to 12,000 public procurement practitioners are operating each day with uh, almost 250,000 public procurement transactions annually. What does it mean? Those each day, have, they have bosses, they have supervisions, they have internal auditors, they have external auditors. We have financial police, we have anti-corruption agency, anti-corruption bureau, and uh, general prosecutor's office, and we, the huge monitoring, the biggest uh, department in our agency is monitoring department, and so on and so on. We are, everything is a pushman. And they're afraid. They're afraid to buy more expensive uh, goods. If you are go next to the next shop, uh, you will see the light. If you are going to buy one lamp, one bulb to buy, the regular is cost 0 0.8 one lari. The lead uh, bulb is cost from five to eight lari. It means that 500 or eight times from five, six, seven, eight times more expensive goods, this is a practical, I mean, this is a practical something thing that they're going, they have families, right? They have 
Uh, they, 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 they have to buy something, goods, products, and something. And everything is more expensive, biological, eco, uh, energy efficient uh, TV set, or freeze, fridge, and so on and so on. And this mentality comes to the sure, to the business, to the job. When there goes to the job, when they're buying five times more, when uh, my, my wife loves uh, special uh, bread, uh, and I'm always fighting this procurement, uh, it's uh, five times more expensive than the regular bread. Five times. And I'm always trying to limit it to the, uh, our family's expenses. Five times. What does it mean? It's a mental thing that the, the good things are more expensive. Uh, the sustainable goods or services are more expensive, uh, and so on and so on. Mentality. Then second point is propaganda. Propaganda, propaganda. I am coming from Soviet Union. I have no idea what, what about your country's stories. But sometimes propaganda is a good thing. So we need propaganda. We need a huge, intensive public awareness campaigns. And this is a huge uh, challenge uh, to uh, reach uh, the uh, decision makers. The, the lady mentioned the coalition of the finance ministers. Please talk to our um, finance minister. Please make propaganda to our Mr. Lashahutshvili. He is a great gentleman. But uh, please tell him the story on the green public procurement and on opportunities. So we have to reach ministers, deputy ministers, and the whole population even, right? My kids, they, they should, should, should benefit from that. The third, sure we need, everybody knows that you need a legal landscape for that re reforms, right? But after that human capital, people, people, we have to uh, we have to have a special training curriculums, new syllabuses, new tools, new manuals, new guidelines, and you know the the, the main challenge. Well, everybody loves you know this European Union Green Deal. They have uh, 23 or 25 guidelines on green public procurement manuals, and blah blah blah. And after when when really you are reaching them really, in real life, not papers. We found, with working closely with European experts, with European government, GIZ, German government is helping us, DENA, and many others, there are no real tool, calculator, or uh, any guidance in order to involve, introduce into the electronic system in order to buy real green. It's everything fake. You know, it's stories. In this country, because of many, many, we, we are one of the most advanced countries in electronic procurement in the world from 2010. Everything, all each transactions are electronically, everything. If one small, small kindergarten is buying piece of paper or one pen for one penny, you can found in our electronic system. We have no cash flow, everything is running via Treasury, state treasury, and so e treasury system, and so on and so on. It means that we cannot go to the back to the paper based uh, something uh, RFPs, RFQs, papers, uh, commissions, calculate something uh, on, on, on uh, calculating scores, and so on. No, we really need very much advanced electronic tools in order to integrate how to buy the furniture. Mm. Very easy, or chair, or ID, or notebook, or something, right? There no, uh, really, the, nobody can advise us and give, can give us the real mathematical formula, how to integrate it into the real algorithm, it, how to procure really, how to help really uh, the, our tender committees. The, those are uh, lessons learned, and so you see the journey is limiting me. So. So, well, thanks, thanks. Uh, sure, we have a, a lot of uh, those stories, and I can share with you, if interesting, a lot of stories. So, a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges. 
Thanks, Dr. for sharing some of the, the challenges and issues that you're facing. Just looking at some of the questions coming through from the pigeonhole as well, um, and it very interestingly sort of can be grouped into two themes, which I'm going to pass over to, to Jeff and maybe Noel to comment on. One is around um, the issue of cost, which you've mentioned that is a challenge. So what would be your advice, Jeff, to um, other practitioners on tackling that issue with Dr. Gar's outline? Second question, maybe later I'll pass on to, to Noel and, and Jeff as well, was around um, what are the matrix in data? How do we measure the success of sustainable procurement as well, which um, also Dr. Kaha has mentioned about the use of data and technology and algorithm. Um, so how can, how can that be leveraged? So um, your, your view, please. Yeah, um, there's a fiduciary element to public procurement and you have to measure the cost or, or, or quantify the rationale for making a procurement decision, uh, quite rightly. Um, it, it, it's public money. Um, so a lot of work and a lot of thought is going into developing tools to measure cost. Cost may not be financial, however. It may be in terms of carbon. It may be in terms of a positive outcome. Um, and it's informed and supported by the value for money concept. So it comes to really the essential question, how am I going to define value in this transaction? And having metrics in there to predetermine those. Um, you can weight them. You can apply a dollar or a lari or a euro value to them um, and, and go in that way. One of the most effective ways of doing this is through life cycle cost analysis. But in that, include the environmental cost, in that include the disposal cost, in that include the land reclamation and rectification costs. Uh, because these are all costs that were not traditionally measured in, in old-fashioned procurement, but should be, uh, especially if you're taking approach towards sustainable procurement. Um, but it's not easy to do, it's new. Um, so we are do, putting a lot of effort into developing tools and guidance around how merit point criteria can be used for weighted costs and so forth. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Noel, there was a quite a few questions coming through around um, in addition to climate finance input measurement, how can we measure the success of climate result and how can we measure the effectiveness of sustainable procurement strategy in combating climate change issues as well? Do you have any view on that? Yeah, no, th thanks, Jenny. And I just want to come back to Dr. Kaka on, on this question of the uh, propaganda, the messaging, but I think it's also really important on who are the messengers. And so one of the attractive parts on the Coalition of Finance Ministers is it is ministers who've already made these changes and who understand what's involved actually promoting that with other finance ministers in, in their fora. And, and I think accessing that is quite valuable. Uh, maybe I'll start, Jenny, and go up a level and then come back to this uh, question. So, I mean, at, just to note, and you'll find it on ADB's um, website, we did launch the Climate Change Action Plan in 2023. And, and, and within that, we've looked at this three different levels of how we engage with government. We talk about it in terms of upstream, midstream, and, and downstream. And, and uh, at the upstream level, this is how we are engaged with the kind of levels of climate ambition that countries have put in place. And, and for most countries, that's set out in NDC, nationally determined contributions. This is the uh, commitment you make with the UNFCCC agreement. Um, but within that, there is that whole area of um, support. So the NDCs will be developed in 2025, the new ambitious commitments to be um, come to the COP. But there is a, the scope to include sustainable procurement as a key for delivering the NDC target. So if we can get that step up um, and to ensure that that is included in the NDCs, I think that would be a very significant step because it starts to relate to our outcomes. Um, and then at this midstream level, it is where we feel that we engage with the country systems levels. So we have the MDBs have a lending instrument, which is policy-based lending 
and within that, we can support DMCs to adopt or strengthen legislations, policies, guidelines, etc., to support the kind of sustainable procurement that 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 Jeff and Dr. Kaka are, are putting through. Um, within uh, the MDBs and ADB, we also have technical assistance finance, which we we work with governments on how to implement and, and strengthen uh, the application of those policies, some of it at institution level. So I, I think we, we need to look at each of these levels in, in terms of when we might want to measure the benefits. And then obviously in terms of at the downstream level, that's the kind of uh, day-to-day -day procurement practices for the investments that have been talked about. And I just put two, two examples on the table. Uh, we have a community resilience partnership program. This is very much focused on investments that address the nexus of um, gender, poverty, and climate. So, so within, and a lot of that focuses on uh, local level adaptation. So we have the scope to also build the capacity of uh, community or local level authorities on uh, how they consider the procurement practices. Um, and then the last one I'd like to mention is in the area of uh, building standards and, and how we all need to, uh, in every country to upgrade our building standards, our building codes, how are they dealing with the kind of extreme rainfall that we've seen in multiple countries in the last few months, uh, the extreme heat, um, and how are they ensuring that we are investing for the future? So I, I would see we see those changes at, at that level. Thanks, Noel. Um, I think we've only got time for one more question, and just grouping a theme um, is around, we talk about working with um, the finance minister, the government, uh, working with the community practitioners. Um, Jeff, you mentioned about the, the role of market shaping as a powerful tool to amplify impact. Can you tell us what's happening next on that in ADB, what, what we're doing on that? Um, one of the things, it, it, it's information. It, it's deep dive diagnostic. And, and you've mentioned, Jenny, that, that, that we're doing this in four countries right now. And we need to understand the markets better than we did previously. Um, you know, uh, 20 years ago, I would never be going along to the Global Cement Manufacturers annual, annual meeting, which I am um, next month, to talk about exactly this subject and this be what I'm presenting to them. They have a net zero uh, commitment by 2050. It's one of the biggest carbon emitters. Um, I'm doing the same thing at FIDIC with the, the International Engineering Federation. Um, so we need very much to understand the markets. Uh, and there is a lot of innovation and technology coming out of those uh, markets that we need to amplify in, in what we do. Um, Right now, I'm looking at cement, but it applies to asphalt, it applies to aluminium, it applies to steel, um, it, it applies to all forms of construction materials. But it also, you know, to um, Noel's point uh, about design standards, I, I was at a university in the US uh, last year. It got hot, so they turned up the air conditioning because the building doesn't have windows. This is not complicated. You know, if you can build in resilience into design standards, uh, I look at the new diamond exchange being built in India that has no air conditioning. It's designed along um, climate lines to be self-cooling. Um, these are innovations that we need to be looking at. Uh, using AI in design standards that reduce the materials required for the same tensile and structural strength. Um, very interesting work coming out uh, uh, at the east coast of America for cement that doesn't use cement and it doesn't use energy, it uses chemical reaction um, as a bonding agent uh, and no actual electricity is consumed. Um, so we need to understand that and we need, when we find uh, a good practice, we need to opportunistically amplify that and support it um, within a country portfolio or within a regional portfolio. 
Thank you. Well, we've reached a time we've got for the, the question and comments today. Um, but just to summarize a key takeaway, I think using Dr. Kaha's um, message is a propaganda and public and private sector, people from different disciplines all have a role to play in this propaganda together. So please join me in extending our thanks to our panel for the insightful contribution. <laughs>
thinking, how can I do this in a more sustainable manner each and every time? How can I weave sustainability, um, starting with the way I sort trash and reusing a cup, but also starting with how we design projects, how we gear up our financing, um, how we measure it. So how do I weave sustainability in everything I'm doing in my role at ADB? Um, the challenge is enormous, but to give up means we've lost already. So be advocates for sustainable procurement. I, I encourage you to get on social media, talk about it, post it on the LinkedIn profiles, on Facebook or, or whatever. I plan, you know, every event that I will be at, I will be mentioning sustainable procurement. So it's about that propaganda, about that message and about the appropriate forums in which to raise this as well. Make sure that we educate and inform decision makers in this. Um, so on that note, um, with my thanks for this very good attendance and engagement. Um, I would like to thank you very much for your time. Nine billion is not a lot of money, by the way. 13 trillion, which is the GDP spend on public procurement annually, is a lot of money. A tiny difference in that 13 trillion is a big difference to our planet. So let's get on and try and do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.